to Occultist Radio, radio for the higher self, with your hosts, Vicki Adams and Jimmy Darling. Made it another week, huh, Vic? <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> another week, and we're back here on Occultist Radio with you guys. We have really a wonderful show tonight. We have uh, Swin Plowright with us. That's a friend of yours. Uh-huh. From Australia. From yeah. Australia. He is a room master. Mm-hmm. God. He's, he's a great, uh, quite a historian. Been reading his books. Yeah, let's talk to him. <laughs> Swin, you're here with us, yes. Yes, made it at last. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I think firstly, I, I don't really like the term room master. I think there's there's been a lot of uh, questionable use of the word, um, and it's not traditional either. Um, a traditional term might be uh, room vitki, okay. which is uh, a Nordic term meaning one who knows so uh-huh. anyone who picks up some knowledge about the runes could call themselves a rune vitki um, from the the same root word as, as wit or wissen in german to know or to be aware of so uh, perfect that's that's what i prefer yes <laughs> okay i think I, we were just going by old information yeah <laughs> yes there are some some people who call themselves that and I think uh, my feeling is that the people who tend to call themselves that uh, not really we know a lot of people give themselves titles yeah yeah but um, yes I've I've met uh, quite a few people who who would call themselves Vicky that I have a lot of time for and a lot of respect for yes who don't call themselves room masters at all okay hmm uh, well, we're, yes. we're happy to have you here on the show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we got some questions for you. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, should I go first? Yeah, right ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, you have written that you are a Sartre and a Reconstructionist. Um, we would like to... Um, we would love to see all ancient religions be taught in their historical foundational philosophy. It's a great launching pad for all students. Um, we firmly and actively agree with this. Um, with that being said, um, let's um, begin with some basic knowledge, you know, uh, understandings. You know, can you, do you mind telling the listeners what exactly is a Sartre and where does it originate from, that word? That's a good question. Uh, the actual word also true means uh, true to the Asir, who, who are the uh, Germanic or Nordic uh, gods. It's the pantheon uh, mm-hmm. from, of the north. And um, that, that term came into being around the 70s, 1970s uh, in Iceland. Um, and people there were, there, there was a group there ruined, ruined, uh Figurating their old religion, and since then it's caught on in other countries, particularly in the U.S. And uh, it really took off in the last, or well, the seventies and eighties, really. It started taking off, mm-hmm. and the the focus is on looking at the historical data and reconstructing as much as possible right. uh, the kind of of religious. Uh, framework that that we can see in the in the literature um, obviously there are limited sources and so we have to take some things with a bit of a grain of salt and say well this this is the closest we can see or that we can reconstruct taking information from other systems as well to to fill in some gaps i think um the main thing is, is to do that honestly. Right. And certainly in the last 10 years, my push has been for more honesty. Um, mm-hmm. Because if, if you go back to the 80s, um, there was a, a quite a bit of, uh, you could say, uh, a superiority coming from 
the heathens uh, toward neo-pagans who were seen as being a little bit less historically based. Um, whereas in the last 10 years I've been pointing out, well, there, there are a lot of things within Arsitry that, that are not really historically based as well. Okay. So we can't really point at other people um, until we, we're honest about what we're doing ourselves. Right. And um, I think that that's pretty much where we are at the moment. There, there's, there is a movement, um, quite a few people like myself who are saying, well, let's get it out in the open. And these are the actual historical texts and records that we've got. Right. This is what we know and this other stuff is what we don't know but we can experiment with and, and move forward with. And so we, we, we come up with a consistent system and we're not claiming that it's the same as, as what happened a thousand years ago because it's not going to be. Right. Uh, we can, as long as we're honest about that, then that, that works. And so there's this balance between, on the one hand, um, what you tend to see a lot in neo-paganism is that, that comes across as dilettantism that people collect bits and pieces from all over the place mm -hmm. in a very superficial manner and sort of stick it together and, and say, well, this is, you know, our new system of whatever it is. Right. Or they, or they fit sort of superficial bits of a system into another system like... Um, uh, Norse Wicca or whatever it is, right, they can just right. slot in the names into yes, the, yeah, the that, old definitely. established format. Yeah. Um, and and that, that tends to, we tend to feel that that devalues a lot of the actual information that we do have, that it puts it into another context, it takes it out of its context and, and so it becomes a lot less powerful, a lot less meaningful. And so there's that, that side of it. And then on the other side, we have people who are, are totally um, rigid about being or, or claiming to be reconstructionist and, and being rigid about a, a system or making claims about that system being, being ancient and being superior about that mm -hmm. and yet not, not really being able to, to back that up right. because we, we just don't have the evidence. And, you know, and so between there, in between there, there is a place where we can have a, 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 on, an honest and rational reconstruction um, that's based on some experiment and some research and, and it's an educated guess. Right. That, right. That's, that's what I think matters and that works for the individual. Mm -hmm. Now that's really important because you don't, you don't really see a whole lot of people that are actually honest about the historical backing of their actual um, their actual philosophies, um, mm. and, and that's huge. That is huge. Um, now I, I do have a question for you because, and and I know you probably you probably get tired of this, but there is a huge disinformation out there about the um, Asatru Asatru. Um, philosophies and a lot of people especially uh, if you go onto the web and things like that you can find good things about it but a lot of the times what you do is you hit the fronts um, the heathen mm. front the pagan front and really all it is is uh, a pagan KKK yes yes that that is unfortunately um, it does taint or, or it tarnishes our reputation as right. a whole that, that there are it tends to be the noisiest types that, that have a political agenda. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, it, that also seeps into some of the mainstream as well. Yeah. But I mean, we, we can be sometimes defensive about saying, oh, we're not that, we're, we're not. But um, there are a lot of people who are. And, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I think uh, the more out in the open it is, the better. Right. But, uh, oh, exactly. So yeah. It's got nothing to do with religion. It's got nothing right. to do with, with personal development. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where we wanted to go with that, that, with that because it, it really doesn't. And, and it's unfortunate right. that they're the ones that the, the, the get to scream the loudest. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Yes, it's very unfortunate. Um, uh, and it goes against what we know of about any sort of religion. It, 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 it's not um, against in, or, or 
it's not exclusive in terms of being uh, how would you put that it, it religion shouldn't really put one group above another mm -hmm. it's it goes against any kind of religion that's out there right. and I think that tends to happen and it's not just us true but a lot of um, cultish religions do that you know it's about the chosen people and um, and there's a sort of paranoia to that that, that it's it's those people against the world and um, I think we we see a lot of religious violence coming out of that kind of attitude right uh, yeah yeah uh, unfortunately yes <coughs> and that really is unfortunately mm. yeah. Uh. yeah it's um, unfortunately quite quite common in recent um, well recent decades I think um, and part of it I think goes back to a, a kind of a monotheistic um, attitude or, or, or background to thinking that that what you know is the truth and, and, and that's it and that nobody else has any um, validity and that, that causes a lot of uh, unrest yeah. yeah I think that's that's really at the heart of it and I think it if you go back to actual pagan times, you, you look at whether it's the Romans or the Germanics or the Celts, uh, they didn't have a, a feeling that um, they were, or their religion was, was special compared to somebody else. They, they just accepted that all different people had all different religions and it was a matter of choice and they all got on reasonably well most of the time. Right. Yeah, even when Christianity came to uh, the north, um, there were plenty of, of uh, stories about uh, particularly uh, pagan men having Christian wives because Christianity at that time was attractive to women and, and they got on fine. It was only when the, the church became uh, part of the government and, and government started enforcing it, right. then they showed their true true colours and, and then persecuted anyone who wasn't of that same religion. So, yes, it's um, that, that need for belief. I've written, recently written an essay about belief and right. the, the problem of defining religion as belief. And it's, it's a, an assumption in our culture because of the, the history of the Abrahamic religions that, that are based on belief. That, that that's what a religion is. And so we're not given any, any other example to, to, to look at. But again, if you go back into history and see the pagans, they didn't define their religion by belief. It was a practice. It was a social um, community. It was a, a, a community um, uh, it togetherness. Yeah. Yeah, uh, rituals that, that, that bound the community together and, right. and they... It was a, a framework that they could understand things by, but it wasn't something that was exclusive. Oh, if you don't believe this, then you're not one of us, sort of thing. That that attitude doesn't seem to have happened until the Abrahamic religions. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's a shame because that, because that's actually caused, I think, most of the wars, if not all of them. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Vic, you got another question, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, about the runes. I mean, and this is a, like a bit of a peeve amongst, you know, a few of us. Um, you know, a lot of the people see the runes. They, 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 they downgrade them to just simply as a modern and quick divinational system. But, you know, we all know that's not the depth of them. Um, can you explain in depth of how the runes are a lifestyle work, you know? You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes, well, they're, they're part of a culture, really. Right. and yeah. Um, and you see it in a lot of the quick manuals today, whether it's runes, tarot, I Ching, any of the um, systems that can be used as divination, yeah. they tend to, people do a quick week's worth of reading up on it, write a book, and there you go, you've uh, got some techniques, and they might bring them techniques true? and mix them from each yeah, one with the true. other. Yeah, that's true of so many yeah. things, yeah, so many systems, yeah. yeah. It's a quick way to write a book, and um, and 
there are a lot of people out there looking for quick answers and, and right. they read the book and say, right, I've got it now. So they'll collect a few of these and they'll suddenly, uh, you know, they'll know a bit about every system but no depth about any one of them. Yeah. And they yeah. never will because they won't have the background or the, the culture that that system comes from. Right, absolutely. Well, well you know, it, you know and, and I've said it a million times in here, and, and I know one day it's good, I'm going to step on my tongue by saying it. But the, some of these modern authors, they read three books, and right. then they write a book about what they read on the three books. And the three books they read were from another modern author who read three other modern authors and wrote a book on it. Yeah. And, it's, uh, <laughs> and really what we're doing is we're now writing books about p opinions of opinions rather of opinions fact. of opinions yeah. rather than history. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've called that, to, in, in, in my book, I've, I called that the room with industry. Oh. But um, there is a bit of an industry that, that people will put together some system. It goes back about 100 years, actually, that um, von Liszt uh, created the Armanen system. And he did the same thing. He, he superficially learned a little bit about uh, the Viking runes. And he added another couple of runes because it wouldn't have made a lot of sense in German um, to only have 16. Right. <coughs> and then um, from that developed the Armanen system, which uh, incorporated some bits of yoga and bits of uh, ceremonial magic from here and there. Right. And they cobbled together a system that um, wasn't so different from the, the modern sort of hybrid systems that, that people do. And so it's been going, going on a long time um, and, uh, you know, I don't, don't want to mention too many names but there are systems now that have been developed from that system and so what we see now is all these things about rune yoga and, um, and, and rune magic put into that, that kind of system, that all came, came from the, the early Armanan stuff from last century. And um, it, it's not at all historical. It's mm -hmm. um, just another th another one of these things. But but having it pushed as a, a as an authentic system is is a bit annoying because it's how do you say it's authentic? You know, it's it's something that was was invented a hundred years ago or less, most of it. Right. So in what way is that authentic? Anything can be called authentic. Right. If you, if you go by that. Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, that, that's why for the last decade or so, a, f a few of us have, have gone outside of that and, s and said, well, you know, wh where are we heading? Are, are we just going to have this big sort of mishmash of, of opinion and, and uh, new inventions sort of thrown in on top of other inventions? Or do we want to try and get down to the basics right. and have each person discovering their own system within that? And I think it, it, it does become a lot more powerful. So when I, when right. I first right. came across the runes, it was in 1972, I read um, <laughs> The Lord of the Rings, like most people. And at that stage, there was nothing there was nothing es esoteric about the runes out in, in, in print at all. Um, so I was looking at uh, encyclopedias and academic works and uh, some of the histories, the sagas and, and the eddas and... Um, and they, those were actually the sources that, that Tolkien himself was um, inspired by. Right. He was a professor of, of literature, uh, mm -hmm. Germanic literature mm -hmm. particularly. And, uh, and that's why his stories seemed very authentic and inspiring. And looking at the ruins at that time, all I had was the, the academic um, side of it wasn't until the 80s that, that uh, books came out that were more esoteric. Right. And I think in a, in a lot of ways I was led astray by that, that, um, you know, there was a, a bit of a rush into all of these, um, into that room with industry. And it took till about the, the late 90s to realise that um, we'd created a bit of a monster. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these, these things had really detracted from, from the, the simplicity and the, the directness of the original. Right. And so um, quite a few of us 
got together at that time and said, okay, we'll, we'll strip away all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's all in yoga and all the, this overlay of, of um, different systems of magic that, that they'd been slotted into and look at what was actually there, what we started with. Right. And we have the rune poems that go back, you know, a thousand years or mm -hmm. so. And we have some of the stories, the sagas, the the editors. Um, <coughs> so there are bits and pieces mentioned that that we can um, use as as primary evidence. Yeah. And right. once we go back to there, we can see well, there there is quite a lot there. We don't really need to to tack on uh, bits and pieces from other traditions or or create some sort of uh, a grand framework out of it. Once you see some of the cultural background and, and, and the original uh, evidence within that, that context, um, you can then start to look at it as, as part of your own life rather than um, going to some sort of guru and getting all this second-hand invented stuff handed down to you. Right. Um, each person can go and... and Look at the the primary sources, and this was was my inspiration for the book, um, the Rune Primer, is that it's it's just basic. It does a bit of myth busting, and it just gives you the basic. You know, this is what anyone can find and and verify um, at a minimum of, minimum minimum of cost <coughs> using some uh, basic academic uh, sources. Right. Oh no! I, you have you actually have a wonderful, wonderful section uh, that I was in your book uh, room primer today, and um, I love that you give the transliteration mm. of the Eddas. Mm. Uh, yes, I, I mean your history. I, I, that that is wonderful because I don't think there is any books out there that actually do that now. Mm -hmm. Yes, I consciously went out to. Um, translate as as closely as possible to the original to give the the feel as well as the the sense of uh, the meaning of the originals um, and so it does it, it's it is virtually a transliteration rather than a translation um, and I've had a, a few good uh, reactions to that I've, I've had some good feedback about that people seem to like it Mm. Well, I, and there's a big difference, and I'm uh, just to, uh, just to, for the listeners to know, to know because I think I've covered it before, is that translation means that you can take poetic license and, and, and a writer's license, a creative license to what you're translating. And transliteration literally means you are literally word, translating word. it word for word. And word for word, that's right. Yeah. And, yeah. and that is such a great thing. You know, I got I got to tell you, I got to tell you, because it, 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 because you, you're telling your you're talking about all the um, the overlays. Um, a while back, we um, got interested in the Rune Guild. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'll tell you something. They came down here, Swim. No, they didn't. We went to Ohio. No, they oh. came down here. Oh, you're talking the, about? When they came to the backyard. The backyard, oh, yeah. And the guy who was leading it was this... Was this supposedly, you know... Um, very experienced, and, he, you know, and but he called himself years. yeah very many years called himself a room master Hildolf, and he and and he called himself Hildolf, and he walked mm -hmm. around like a neo Nazi in these big boots doing big old goose steps, and I thought well maybe I can get past that, <laughs> and so we went they they were going to do a ritual, and all of a sudden they get grab a, a set of drums and they start yeah. drumming to the Santeria Orishas. Yeah. Then they I went to was, break a I circle. I think it was like Yamaya. Yamaya. Then they went to break a circle and they cut a pentagram into it. And I just looked at him and I said, and then "Well, I'm about done." Did a guided <laughs> meditation. It was it was such a. Uh, and and I don't, unfortunately, I don't, I don't that was the it. LA. That was the LA okay. chapter of chapter the of it. And we were yeah. like, and we were like, what is this? You know, like, I mean, what are these people learning? And and then supposedly they were learning from Edward, um, you know, Stephen Flowers, Thorson. Edward Thorson, or whatever you want to know, you know, whatever you know him by. And mm -hmm. um, a lot of his work is being. Is currently um, scrutinized. Is scrutinized and disputed right now. Mm. So yes, um, there's no guidance whatsoever. 
and yeah, people, should, I, people should be aware of that because I'm that's sorry. what they're encountering. <laughs> I've tried to be a bit careful about it because, um, yes, from from 1990 till about 2000, for that decade, I was um, asked by Edra to, to lead the South Pacific region. Right. Um, I was steward of the South Pacific region. Hildolf was steward of the... California you or You know East exactly Coast, who we're talking like about, that. right? <laughs> Hildolf. Uh, Andrew is his name. Yeah. His yeah. name is Andrew. <laughs> yeah. God. Um, <laughs> and there are a few other people who are involved, but uh, I think one of the reasons, um, well, certainly the, the main reason I, I headed off in my own direction was was because I was starting to th see through it, and I, right. I did attend a couple of the um, uh, the moots, the guild moots in Texas in '96 mm -hmm. and '97, uh, where I met Edred. I stayed with him for a couple of weeks each time, and um, we had some talks. and And there were, you know, some of the other uh, leading figures in there, the other um, stewards, and and so-called green masters in this uh, central circle, the inner circle, as it were. Um, and I just came away feeling that, uh, yeah, there was a bit of a con going on. Right. And I think I think Edward really picked up on that and, and basically stopped talking to me for the, the yeah. next couple of years. He stopped and so talking to us. Out. <laughs> Yeah, he stopped, he stopped talking, talking to, us. to us as well. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. you know what? We were we attended the one in Ohio, yeah, and, and I couldn't have been more disappointed. We were sorely disappointed on many levels, um, mm. and quite insulted too on many levels. Um, but um, just the stuff. Well, is, yeah, go on, Hunter. Yeah, it's 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 a thing about um, being cultish. I think. Yeah, absolutely. He, he did design the thing to be a cult, and that means to. To control the beliefs of the that's individuals. What, <laughs> that's what yeah. we realized when we attended that movie. It was, well, like it was shortly afterwards we got an invite to, to come down to Texas, live on the ranch, uh, so buy, that we, just buy so, an island off so of that, Yeah, that Texas. we can compile all our money <laughs> and buy, buy an island outside the U.S. control so that all the people could go and wait. Uh, uh, and, and, and so uh, all the rim people could go and wait for I don't know some kind of <laughs> sign or something, and all I could think, think to myself Waco. was, "Hello, Jonestown." Mm. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I was, wasn't going to put it that way, but uh, uh, <laughs> that, that, it, it was not too long after the David Koresh thing that um, yeah. that we we went to Texas, and when we finished there, um, Cara and I were, were saying, oh dear, that's <laughs> another uh, Waco <laughs> right, <laughs> making. exactly. Uh, yeah. You know, and we, we actually <laughs> were in disbelief when he told us, and I think the look the looks on our faces must have been of pure horror because he was like backing down, um, we were saying, are you serious? And he was like, oh, um, no, 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 it's, it's all a joke. And I just and, kind of looked but, at him and said, well, I'm not taking any Kool-Aid there, buddy. <laughs> and, and, but but, but um, he stopped talking to us shortly yeah, after that. Yeah, and it's just, it, was, it was a huge disappointment because we did hold a level of respect for him and what he has, had done, um, you know, his volume of work. But I, I don't know. I mean, just, just the way almost everyone conducted themselves at this moot was really... A bit of an eye opener, and nothing to like what I experienced when you know when in Australia when we used to do those um, the winter feasts. Yes, those winter feasts, uh, mm. which were which were brilliant, you know, and um, educational, entertaining, um, a nice sense of camaraderie. You know what I mean? It was it was it was well balanced. You know, yeah. there was no pretense. There was no you know, ugh, everything was you know laid out. Um, and everyone was welcomed, you know. Yeah, I think so, we're lucky in Australia that yeah. um, we tend to be a, a little bit uh, more cynical in a sense yeah. that we, we don't, we don't, we're not easily impressed by titles. Right, right, we, yeah. We take people at, you know, Americans as they are. Yeah, yeah, I, I learned that. Um, Amer Americans really are, yeah. they're, they're always looking for a guru. To I, save took, them. I took that to heart, so when I came to, to America, I was really cynical. Because everyone mm. had a title, 
and there, there was so many stereotypes. I was just like, wow. I when I left Australia, I mean, even then I had a few funky experiences. I was like, I don't want to set foot in another cult store for as long as I live. <laughs> um, even though, of course, you know, now you own one. I, I know, um, but you know, um, yeah, yeah. So I learned a hell of a lot. But these titles, you know, these this pretense, it's very destructive. And um, it's it's just self delusional, you know. Yep, yep, exactly. Um, that that's why the first thing I did after leaving the um, the guild was was to well to to basically get rid of any titles. Um, what we had, we we had about forty members right. in uh, Australia, um, and we were the South Pacific region. And um, after being ignored for two years and not being able to get books or anything, uh, um, right. we decided to cut our losses. And rather than just resign, because that was one of my options, I thought, well, that would leave nobody to organise the people who had, in good, you know, good faith, um, joined us. So I put it to them that um, we could just go sep our separate ways instead, and that that was. Uh, yeah. Almost unanimous. There's only one vote against that. Right. Um, I'm sure I know who that was. That you, can, <laughs> you can figure out who that was. Yeah, I know exactly who that was. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Starts with an L, Jimmy. Oh, the yeah, hippie. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the hippie. Yeah, anyway. Um, anyway, it was, yeah, it was a, such a huge disappointment. But um, I guess it turned out for the best, you know, um, for you guys. Oh, it certainly did for us, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, we've been accused of, of trying to be competition. Or, you oh, know, give me a break. And I have yeah. to laugh, you know. Yeah. I'm so busy with, with a lot of other stuff. Exactly. I'm writing another book on a completely different topic. Right. Um, I've been publishing scientific articles. I've got a career in IT. It's you know, yeah. really taken off. Um, there's so many things in my life I don't <laughs> need to to compete with with right. what they're doing. Uh, yeah. Well, that I just tells you they have nothing going. And, and it's ridiculous because it's such a personal journey and all these people can see is some, you know, pr conceived competition. That's oh. It's just not even what it's about. Well, what they're seeing is a power grab yeah, and it's, it's not what Swan's yeah. doing. Yeah, and it just shows how, how unsteady they are on their feet, you know what I mean, with what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Know? there's a paranoia there that um, shows that they, they haven't got the confidence. Right. If they think I'm some sort of threat, then yeah. they have very little confidence because yeah. I don't have time to, to be a threat. But I can yeah. offer people maybe an alternative, but it's not even that. It's just a network of people, yeah. a network yeah. of equals. We've no, nobody's yeah. got titles. We're just people who are studying, yeah. and um, there are about 120 of us now. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, yeah. Uh, and we communicate privately on, on a, a Yahoo group, and um, we share some resources, and that's pretty much... Much it, you know. Yeah, and we have friends doing similar things as right. well in, in other networks. So yeah. it's not just us; it's other networks who have come to the same sort of conclusions. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're definitely not an egotistical maniac, so <laughs> they shouldn't have anything to worry about. Um, anyway, let's just get off of that, I guess. Um, well, let's get to the editors. A lot of people actually are not even. I mean, we we did state that they are um, poems. Um, can you talk about um, how how they're used, they're utilized? Well, there's a, there's a poetic editor and there's a prose editor. Okay, and yeah. They cover a lot about the mythology. They're the main source of, of Germanic mythology. Really, they're from the Viking times. Um, they're in Old Norse originally, and um, they they cover the the whole story from from the beginning of the world, you know, the, the Ginunga Gap and um, the, the creation of the, the first people and uh, it goes through a lot of the, the uh, stories of the gods and the creation of monsters and, you know, fighting giants and all of that sort of thing and then ends up uh, finally in Ragnarok, which is like the end of the world. Um, and the... The whole thing can be seen symbolically as as stages of uh, of development and and ideas and um, 
you could say, you know, in the religious sense, it's it's the individual's journey through mm-hmm. discovery. Um, there are a lot of ways you can you can actually understand it, and people are inspired by it, <clears throat> and it also gives a framework or a, a context to understanding uh, things like the runes and um, and other Germanic. Uh, Parts of Germanic culture, right? And so, they are, they are quite important. Uh, and I mentioned this um, a few times that um, if if you don't re- if you're not interested in in the Eddas at all, if you're not interested in that cultural framework, then um, the runes sort of lose their meaning. It's just a, another could be any sort of symbols on it. You know, written somewhere to to mean something, whatever you want to mean. You know, it's it it doesn't have any deeper value. Right. And that's a mm. shame because yeah. because the Eddas actually allow you to do, delve into your own oh, psychology. It, yeah, totally. Mm. Yeah. Yes, um, there have been some good books written generally on on Arsatru and and Germanic mythology. Um, the Our Troth books are quite good. I found. Right. They're very. They have a very academic base, but they're also quite practical. Right. <coughs> so um, there are two volumes, um, and I think they were put out by the Ring of Troth oh, about three or four years ago, but based on some earlier books that have been put out quite a few years ago. Right. But um, these books go through all the, the primary sources and also through suggestions for modern-day uh, the modern day manifestation of or the use of that religion by individuals today mm-hmm. in a way that doesn't make them sort of anachronistic or, or irrelevant mm-hmm. um, and I think that it, that is always the danger with uh, reconstructions is that people can become too focused on the past right. <coughs> and think that they're living in the past and, and then they're not very effective in the in the present when that happens. Right. That, that's a huge that's, problem. Yeah. 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 People live in fantasy land. Right. They 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 dress up and they, you know, see it with with even in the SCA. You know, to some extent, people right. have their lives right, right. lives and they take it so seriously and they, uh, and the same thing happens in in other re- reconstruction groups that. It becomes their life and their, their politics and their uh, reason for living half the time. And you think, well, don't these people have a life out, outside this? They take it all so seriously and they they don't have much outside of that. But that may be why, because they don't have much right. else to, to live for. And it could be, but you shouldn't take life too seriously because in the end no one actually gets out alive. Mm. <laughs> <Good point. laughs> And the, well, they don't. And the thing of it is, is you meet so many people, and they're straight based, and they won't joke, and they they have a zero sense of humor. And if you try to crack a joke, they they, they just look at you horrified, like you just did the most improper thing. Um, mm. uh, um, uh, you know, somebody. Uh, you know what? Some we actually have a question in the chat room for you. I, uh, we actually have a chat room that's going while the show's going, and we're streaming live. We have a a live audience here in, uh, on, on the chat room, and Aurora would like to know, uh, she's curious about Swen's opinion on Diana Paxson's book, Taking Up the Runes, as far as historical accuracy. If, you've, if you're aware of that person. Yes, I've, I've seen a little bit of it. I, I haven't really read it cover to cover, but I, I've I had a quick look, look at it. Um, and I reviewed it on Amazon. Um, I gave a fairly positive review, but I, I made the point that it's it's a, a good collection of modern ideas of well, yeah what people are doing today with the runes, and it's I, you can't see it as a historical document at all. It right. has some historical information that that you could verify but uh, that's not the purpose of the book it's not the focus it seems to be more to do with um, the way different people are doing things um, today and 
Yeah, there's good and bad in that. <laughs> you could say, on the one hand, it, you could see it as perpetuating this room with the industry, but on the other hand, um, it, if you're interested in what people are doing now, the current state of things, then uh, for that purpose, it's quite a good, uh, uh, quite informative, yeah. Right. Okay, excellent. Thank you for answering her question. Now, now, Swen, you you actually, I want to talk about you. I want to talk, and let's talk books. about Swen Plowright <laughs> <laughs> and your books. Yeah. Now, can you tell us about your books and a little bit about them? Because you actually go into several different topics of things. You're, you, you've got such a great historical mind. Well, really, <laughs> um, my first, first one, True Helm, was... Uh, really to do with being inspired by um, history and by our ancestors mm -hmm. and how to be inspired by them without being um, anachronistic, without w longing to be in the past, right. if you know what I mean. Right. Bringing it into the future or into the present. And that book um, did go through a few of the uh, some of the historical side of things, but it was more to do with an awareness of, of our ancestry and right. um, and how that contributes to our, our place in the present. Right. Was there a warrior aspect to that book, or was I... Yes. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought. It's, that's right. It's been so long, mm. yeah, since I've um, picked it up, but... Yes, um, uh, after being in the army for a while and, and uh, studying martial arts with Gare Fox Stern for 15 years. Um, I, I just, uh, it, it all came together for me at that time that um, there was there was a way to, to be, uh, to utilise warriorship in the modern world where it, it covered both um, the aspects of being successful in your life right. as well as self-defence. Right. And so it combined those those things with with an awareness of our ancestral warriorship as well. Right. So it's just tying in those those things. Yeah. Um, and, and it also contains a, a retelling of the the Wayland story uh, that illustrates some points about warriorship as well. Okay. And the whole thing is is uh, an explanation of weird as well, and the oh, concept perfect. of yes. all things being tied tied in together. And right. that was a big concept in in our um, heathen ancestors' worldview, right. um, and, and being aware of weird and and how you can work with it, right. and that you can't escape it, but it's not inevitable either. You you can mm -hmm. you can mould it, and so it's it's. Um, People, a lot of people tend to have an idea either of predestination or, or you know, like they can't escape their fate sort of thing. Right. Or other people have a, the, the concept that there's no, there's no consequence to what you do. Whereas Weird was in the middle. It said, well, everything you do has an effect. Right. Everything will flow on and, and create uh, opportunities and obstacles for you. But the nature of those things is constantly updated according to how you act um, towards all of the things in your life. Right. And so there's individual weird and there's greater weird, your family weird, the, the country's weird. And all, everything links in together and everything, everything fits together. Um, uh, and it's, it's being aware of that that creates the um, possibility of... Uh, success and and a force for life, a, a life that that means something. Hmm. I think that's that sums it up. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you had you had room primer. Yes, the uh, room primer was the the one. It, it started off as uh, an in-house manual for for our our group, our network. All oh, right. And um, and it was just originally the the first half of it, which covered the basics about the um, 
the runes and the, the different rune rows and rune poems. Um, and then uh, I was asked to make it available to, to others, <coughs> um, which I did. I printed an expanded version with the, the um, uh, myth-busting section at the back and some um, reviews or analysis of, of various authors. Right. Um, and then um, I was asked to, to, well, after it became too much of a, a burden on me to keep printing it and, and um, distributing it from home, I um, published it on uh, a print-on-demand service right. that uh, now distributes it through Amazon and, and other bookstores. So, and it's done surprisingly well. I was, I was quite surprised. Yeah, how. we've sold quite a few copies too. Yeah, it's yeah. Um, a pleasant surprise. Yeah, no, no, that's good, yeah. <laughs> no, it's good. And I got to tell you, um, I did more research, um, you know, because we, we had your books and your Vicky's friend. But I did, you know, I, I did some research typing in and Googling in, watching your Amazon things. And I got to tell you, you took a big risk taking part of your book by reviewing other authors. And... and, and Congratulations, because yeah, that was that was a big step going out there and calling out people for who they were. Yeah, I mean, you know, because they were misleading people. I mean, at least I thought they were. <laughs> well, I tried to be respectful. But in the yeah, way I did we did. You weren't out and out flaming anyone. You were very um, constructive. Trying to, yeah, yeah, I trying to be a bit businesslike about right. it and just saying, well, these. This is this is their focus, and that's that's what they do. I wasn't wasn't judging them. I don't think. No. Um, yeah. I've had from certain quarters. You'd expect. Yeah, well, I've course, had some yeah, pretty yeah. nasty. Yeah. Uh, A lot of emails, people, but yeah, wouldn't take it the right way. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. But any authors. But from the majority, I've had yeah. good good uh, responses. Yeah, I was going to say any author's subject to criticism. I'm um, I'm just saying criticism. Not not stating that's what you did, but everyone's under scrutiny of some sort, you know. And, you and the thing is, anytime you take a false guru and you and you and you attack them, their followers yeah. will will attack back because they can't stand on what their author says, so they have to attack back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty commonplace, though, amongst a lot of religions. So, but I, I got—I just got to tell you, kudos on that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Even that was not the focus of the book. So, no, it's not the focus Obviously. of the book. But, but you know what? It was nice, and and I did see a lot of people who came up this when and said, "Gosh, it's nice to know." Mm -hmm. It's it's nice to know what you think about them. It's nice to know. It's nice to get some facts out yeah, there. Yeah, it's, it's nice, nice to know we're not the only people saying it. Like, because we, you know, if people ask us in the store, we'll be we'll be constructive and respectful, but we will tell them our opinion. I was, and we will say, but that's our opinion. But you know, it's nice to, and and nobody else will really come out and say anything. So it's nice to um, see someone oh. else. Reflect. That's where I made my mistake. I, I, I didn't hear you say the word. I had to be respectful. Oh, well, yeah, well, you are sometimes. <laughs> but so, um, often not, she's not. <laughs> o often I'm a loose cannon. Well, I usually, you know. Oh, there's a good, good purpose for people like that too. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. You've got to point out that the emperor has no clothes. Somebody's got to do it. <laughs> well, the thing is, the reason why it's not such a good idea is that we do want, we do um, try to teach respect and tolerance. So if we act in a contrary manner, you know, it you, doesn't. You can't yeah. tolerate stupidity. I I know there's. <laughs> <laughs> there's no tolerating stupidity. I know, but she's she's uh, she overplaying it. You're not that bad, but. I, I hear I hear most of it privately, but you know. I told somebody today on the web that they should put a paper bag over their head and throw themselves off a pier because I bet they'd drown. The guy answered back, I don't know what that means. And I said, it means you're too stupid to fight your way out of a wet paper bag. <laughs> <laughs> to which she responded, I'm not talking to you anymore. Yeah, he's but. not going to talk to me no longer. <laughs> I, you yeah. know, but... but <laughs> um, anyway, that aside. Now... now um, there are, there's a lot out there on how to uh, ca cast the runes, and, and two of the things I'd like for you to hit on is number one, all these all these books that are coming out with reversals. Oh, the reversals are such a pet peeve. Mm. 
it's you know I think that that stems from the, the false you know well it, that goes to the tarot. second pet peeve and that is making it's, the runes into a tarot deck yeah yeah, yeah. exactly it's yeah. it's a borrowing from the tarot right yeah and yeah well you expect that if if people they learn a bit about tarot then they pick up the runes and try and write something equivalent about that and and so half of what they've learned about the tarot seeps in on top of the runic stuff yeah. so yeah it's not unexpected it's been going on a long time right um, and so yeah but the thing These is, days. you're tossing the runes. I mean, at any can you know, not always, but you know, in uh, commonly, you're going to toss the runes. Of course, they're going to spin every which way, as mm. you know. Even that, even though the tarot is, of course, you know, they were playing cards, so there's no up or wrong side way round. You know, um, they're they're taking because they do flip when you you know when you do a spread by nature. It's mm. nothing to do with anything, any kind of reversal. Um, you know, like sim symbolic, you know, like divinational thing. But the runes themselves, you know, they're being tossed. I mean, what do they expect? I mean, how are yeah. you going to do those in reverse? And some I of mean, them are either way up. And then, way, and then they, or, and what about the sideways ones? You know, they've got to yeah. land sideways too. I mean, how do you determine a reverse? Yeah. I mean, they'll even well, do it in a it's toss. It's the same, yeah. same both ways. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, because <laughs> they're applying it to the runes right, and, and to the cards. The rune printed mm. cards, which are just like, well, you know, hello, they were on word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, you know what, which brings up, brings up another point. Swen, what were the runes, what, how were the runes actually carved and what were they usually carved on? Yeah, exactly. Because that's a huge debate on what they were, they were on. So, because, you know, they got these, these stones that are round. And, and they're carving they've, them on there. They've got they've put, they put them on polished tumbled stones these days, um, yeah. it, or bone, you know. Well, from what we see in in history, from what survived, usually it's um, carved on wood. And the common theory is that um, the reason why there are no horizontal lines is is so that they get, don't get stuck in the grain right. when you're carving. A message along a piece of wood, right? Um, and that makes makes quite a lot of sense, Perfect um, sense. because we do see uh, there are some surviving um, what do you call them uh, like uh, product labels for um, um, trade and sa sales right. in, in some of the old Viking towns, and they had wooden. Um, little wooden uh, like these short planks that, that had the, the products listed on them and um, and that that's that made sense they were written you know along the grain of the wood so that the the um, strokes would always go either across the grain or diagonally um, and yeah that makes makes a lot of sense right. and it's quite likely that a lot of messages were sent written on a stick, right. which was a common Roman way of, of sending messages as well. Right. It was quite common around Europe at that time. Right. Yeah. How about um, the belief that each rune was carved on a... You know how each rune has a, 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 ver a tree that represents it? That mm. each rune was carved on the wood of each representative tree. Which is a huge yep. undertaking in itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never seen anything in the historical evidence to say anything like that. Right. But it Fact might have been possible, who knows. Oh, I want to do it. I, I said, why? I, like, I, 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 I want to clip the piece of wood from every tree that it represents <laughs> and actually get a ring that's got the energy of that tree. I'm in wondering it. how many years that would take. <laughs> Some of those trees you might have to grow. The, uh, yeah, or definitely visit other countries to obtain. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> just as well, a that little, dedication. just a little flight of fancy, I think. But you know, <laughs> of course. Oh, well, you could be the first first person to do it. I've never heard <laughs> of it <done> before. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm. Well, we're coming up to the top of the hour. <laughs> Swen, uh, give people uh, ways to get your books and websites and ways to contact you. Right. 
Um, yes, uh, the the book, the the Ruin Primary, is available on Amazon. So. Yes, just just search. Even if you do search on ruins in Amazon, it comes up on the first page, which is quite fortunate. Right. Um, the True Home is uh, at the moment only available uh, through our website because it's printed. Because I print it myself, it's a very short run, um, quite a specialised thing. So I, d I didn't see any point in in trying to. Uh, publish it more widely. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> our site, uh, www.maccaos.com.au slash roomnet is, um, is our uh, website. Um, slash, yeah. Is, um, and, and you can find the books on there as well. So if you're looking for more information and uh, we also have some information about uh, the network and, and what we do and uh, that sort of thing if people are interested in joining um, a non-hierarchical network mm. all right mm. yeah, well thank you so much Swen <laughs> for joining us and taking time out with us and our listeners. All right. Can you just repeat that website again? Because I'm the trying Mac to... The Chaos? It's... it's okay. is www. It www. Yeah. Dot m a c k a o s. Okay. Dot com dot a u. She's trying to type yeah. it into the chat room. Yeah, just because... <laughs> just yeah. so that they have it. Dot com dot a u yeah. slash. slash... And forward slash capital R for room... Hyphen capital N net. Okay. <coughs> so it's written net the Thank hyphen you. capital R and capital N. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, oh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, it was great talking to you. And Ka Kara says to say hello to uh, you. <laughs> she she miss, misses you. <laughs> we, we'll need to chat down the line. <laughs> yeah. Miss her too. Um, but thank you. You were a wonderful guest. And in. in highly informative and it's always great to talk to an actual um you know educated and informed yeah person. yeah educated and informed person and you're getting thanks from the uh, chat room yeah and everyone's thanking you oh uh, thank you for taking time and i'm, I'm so so impressed with what you've done with your shop as well oh thank mm, you so much going overseas and, and starting a shop in the middle of hollywood no, no less <laughs> <laughs> i didn't and that's, that's I, good that's yeah. very impressive that's yeah. what i mean by manifesting your weird yeah. or manifesting your will oh thank that's you although i got yeah. i have to state i didn't start the store <laughs> but, no, but 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 took up the the reins because it was floundering when jimmy and i came along so um, you know, yeah, but I, but thank you for the acknowledgement. Alrighty. <laughs> Alrighty, have a good, have a good Saturday. Yeah. Alrighty. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks a lot. See Thanks. you later. All right, bye. Oh, bye. That was great. That was great. That was Swen. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're actually going to have a, um, we're actually going to have a slight music break so that we can just gather ourselves. And when we come back, we're actually going to uh, go through some of the foundations of the rinse. We're going to go through some of the learning and casting and, 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 and how to make a binding room and things like that. It's going to be fun, so please stay tuned for the second half of the show. Uh, in the meantime, actually enjoy one of Swen's uh, music, uh, music uh, song, uh, one of his songs. One of his compositions. Compositions called Leaving Earth. And here you guys go.
Welcome <laughs> back to the cultist right. That's right. I, 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 I we got a mixer board and we've had it. And I, I, I have fought the temptation to keep my hands off of the special okay. effects buttons, uh -huh. but it's not my fault. It's not my fault. Yes, so. it is. Oh, it was low key, I suppose. Oh, you, you are, are playing, playing now. now. Anyhow. Just to wake everybody up on Friday the 13th. No, just so I refuse to speak. I know she refused to speak. That was. Um, yep. Now you just, now you just, now you won't even play along. Mm. It's Friday the 13th. What a great show. <laughs> and, and you know what? I'm Let's having fun. Th I, I'm having a blast. <laughs> I'm having a blast. The people in the chat room are like, what the hell's wrong with them? I know. So you make me look weird. I, I, <laughs> yeah, that says a lot. Um, <laughs> let's talk, you know what, let's talk a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the superstitions of Friday the 13th. Uh, well, you know, because, hey, let's take advantage of this, shall well, we? Well, we might as well, yeah. You know, that, now, the, you know, because uh, it kind of ties in because there is actually a, a there's story. A, there's um, a Norse one, yeah. There's a Norse one on why Friday the 13th is superstitious. And uh, we're going to, we're just, we're just taking a little sideline before we get into the runes. Inside the uh, chat room, I actually typed up a, a link to occultistradio.com forward slash runes dot uh, gif. 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 Uh, that'll take you right over to the picture of the rin so that when we get to it, you guys can have that pulled up. It'll open another browser up in the chat room for you guys. Now let's uh, let's talk about let's talk about uh, let's talk about some of the mythology. Let's go right to the Norse mythology, and you know the mythology of the of the superstition is is in North mythology because Friday is actually named for um, Frigga, Frigga, mm -hmm. and the free spirited goddess of. Love and fertility. Um, yes, those are sirens in the background. That is the pleasure of being a couple of blocks away from the police station and the fire department. Um, now, when the Norse and when the Norse and Germanic tribes converted to Christianity, Frigga was banished in shame to a mountaintop and labeled a witch. And it was believed that every Friday, the spiteful goddess convened a meeting with eleven other witches plus the devil, a gathering of thirteen, and plotted ill turns of fate mm -hmm. for the upcoming week. And so, you know, I don't know if you know this, but most Fridays were known as the Witch's Sabbath. Yep. So good. Um, so welcome so welcome to the Occultist Radio on the Witch's Sabbath. Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, um, one that I know that you, I've heard you teach in your class. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, since I've heard your class like 20 billion times. What are you trying um, to say? Nothing. Um, the Knights of Templar, um, I don't know if a lot of people are aware of this, were a monastic military order founded in Jerusalem in uh, 1118 BC, in CE, duh, yeah, <laughs> CE. Well, well you, know, you know what it is, um, is, um, is that they were actually, they were founded a little bit before that, but it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't but until this, 1118 in this, this in this is that uh, the church yeah, ordained them. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Um, I, yes. Um, anyway, their mission was to protect the Christian pilgrims in, during the Crusades, but um, subsequently, you know, over the next you know two centuries, the Knights of Templar became an extraordinarily powerful and wealthy entity, and of course, this threatened <laughs> the church, and um, so the the and the king of the time, well, the uh, king of France, King yeah, Philip. King Philip, King Philip the Fair, yeah. Who um, he actually secretly um, ordered a mass arrest of all the Knights of Templar in France on Friday, October the thirteenth, thirteen o seven. Um, so that's another another law, a bit of historical law as it to is, why and, it's and considered a ominous day. And then there's one last theory, and the theory is goes back to a combination of paganism, Christianity, and the Battle of Hastings. Right. And uh, for many, the number 13 was considered a lucky number, such as the 13 lunar cycles each year. But with the efforts of Christianity attempting to degrade all things pagan, they promoted 13 as an unlucky number, with mm -hmm. Friday thus also being considered a bad luck day of yeah. the week. Um, however, on Friday the 13th of October in the year 1066, mm -hmm. 
the decision was made by King Harold II to, uh, to go into battle on Saturday the 14th. Uh, of October, rather than to allow his troops to rest, mm -hmm. and this, uh, you know, and they had just they had walked, they, you know, they'd been walking for three weeks. This is a tired army, and this decision in going into battle before the English troops were rested um, uh, further established the Friday the Thirteenth as an unlucky day because uh, King, uh, not only did King Harold's troops lose, mm -hmm. King Harold himself was killed. I mean, I'm sure to this day. I mean, I know that you know, 18th, 17th, 16th centuries, a lot of, um, like, say, for instance, farmers would refuse to start a plow on a Friday. A lot of people would refuse. They'd, they'd maybe do, like, a scratch, and that was it, and resume it the next day. It was yeah. just considered to study, to um, considered unlucky to undertake any new beginning, like well, a, a new project. In a Europe, new, in Europe, yeah. Frigga. Yeah. Because of Frigga. Yeah. And the mythology so, behind that. And I have a feeling, even like in small towns, this probably still holds true. It might, it might. You know, so, anyway. So, I guess, you know, black cats and ladders <laughs> aside. <laughs> I mean, you know, we all consider black cats lucky, in, you know, in this store, but... Yeah, step <laughs> on the crack now. Yeah. Yeah, I always used to step on the cracks and walk under ladders, so... <laughs> it didn't, that, that explains a lot about it. It does not. I'm perfectly fine. Um, and I have a Sagittarian lucky streak, so. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, let's just get back to the runes. Um, okay, there are many schools of thoughts <clears throat> and how to define the runes and the edders. The edders are, of course, the poetic verses from which much of the knowledge of the runes is derived from. And this is going to be a basic foundational meaning of the runes. And we, like Swan, encourage you to think about the Edda and what the meaning is to you and your connection to the universal powers. You know, how is it that you personally connect to it? You know, um, it's, you know, it's meant for you to... Um, what is it? Delve inwards. Um, inwards to take personally yeah. and make it yourself. Yeah, and make it your. You know, yeah, you're, you're not own. supposed to. You know, in any divination. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're that's not what supposed I'm saying. to just take the face value. It's supposed to be what it you is have to you. To develop and really go into some it. personal connection to it. Um, you know, anyway, um, there are also many interesting ways oh. to practice that, and we will discuss the how tos in shortly. So, and Jimmy actually has a really interesting background in her learning of the runes. And so this is um, pretty much like one school. And I mean, and it, she's going to recount her experience, which is I found pretty unique. And, and it was how the runes were shown and taught to her. So I'll let her go into it because it's a really, really fascinating story. Well, it's fascinating to me, but I'm sure it'd be fascinating to other people as well. Yeah, it was quite interesting. I know if it was me, I'd be like all kinds of, you know, thrilled <laughs> if it happened. Yep, yeah, yep, it was interesting. Anyway, back to the... No. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a tease. I, I, that's what they tell me. Um, I got to tell you, um, I was stationed overseas in, in the military. And, um, and, of course, I went to school there. And, and I had a good time there. And um, I did a lot of odd traveling. Um, you know, I, I did spend my time in London, and I did spend my time, you know, doing the normal stuff in Soho and the, and, and, and the hitting, touristy things, the touristy right? things, yeah. and, and and hanging with some of the locals. But then I did the odd, I did the weird uh, little villages where um, I would get, I'd get this just sense. To get in my in, in my mini. Well, I didn't have a mini. I had a Morse Brown, and and um, it did same and, thing. <laughs> yeah, and just kind of no, the Morse Brown is just a tad bigger. I know it's a little longer. It's yeah. a little longer, and it's harder to pick up to parallel park. Yeah, I know. <laughs> See, at least with the mini, I didn't have to parallel park because I could just get out and like all of us in the car could pick it up and move it to the yeah. curb. <laughs> I didn't have to look like a bad American driver. Yeah, you look like you had mad parallel parking skills. Yeah, I yes. did. <laughs> but um, the thing of it is, is um, I just drive. Uh, I'd have time off. I th I'd say you guided. Yeah, you know. I think so. Uh, but I'd get in a car and I'd have no idea where I was heading to. I would just go ahead and decide on a road mm -hmm. out of uh, you know because my base was actually. Um, 
Uh, Serenity says, I do something weird. No. Mm -hmm. Uh, No, not me. I don't do weird things. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, But I I would actually, uh, my base was around some smaller villages, and they, you know, they didn't have a lot of roads out, but you'd hit these big roundabouts that have seven decisions on which way to go. And I would just get in the car, and I would just choose... A random road. A random road. And I drive, and I figured that if I drove no more than, say, three hours out on a weekend, I could find a and b stay, and then come back the next day. So, you know, on my weekends. And so I, I got in the car, and I drove out, and I ended up in this tiny village. And I mean, it's a small village. Um, it's it, And it didn't even have a name. It really didn't. Right, it was no name? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they basically had a sign that says, Welcome to No Name. And it's not on maps. I wonder if it still exists. I have no idea. But I walked in, into this vi- or I drove into this village, and I got out of my car. And I'm kidding you guys not. All the signs in the ha- place looked like runes. They were all carved in the ways of the way of runes. And um, I got out, and I'm walking down the sidewalk, and there's... Hardly anything there. There really is maybe about four or five uh, shops, but I think I was um, kind of lost in the fact that they didn't have addresses. They had a rune. The rune was their address. That's really cool. And there was a shop, and all it had was an odal. Mm-hmm. The, uh, the rune, odal. How would you describe that for people? Like uh, if they go to uh, www.occultistradio.com slash oh, runes dot it. GIF, it's it. the okay. very last rune. Right. And um, I walked in, and it was a, kind of a small place, and the windows were blacked out. And I tried the door because it didn't say anything. Like, the rest of them would describe what they were. And I tried the door, and it opened, and I thought, well, I'll just go in. The door's open. Right, because if they didn't want me in there, they would have locked the door. Obviously, <laughs> not, uh, that, not that that's a hint for you to be able to do it. And no, but little villages rarely lock their doors. Oh, well, okay, <laughs> okay. Warning to the little villages: if I'm coming, lock your doors. Because if it's open, I'll just walk right in. Um, I don't think they'd mind. <laughs> probably not. Uh, but I walked in, and this this little guy comes out, and he's got a really thick accent, and it's not British. It's so kind of, I don't even know how to describe it. It was Germanic in well, nature, but not German. Well, these people originated from, just describe their passage. Oh, uh, okay. So probably be a combination of that. Uh, these, uh, after I got done with this guy in, in the shop, uh, this lady told me that, uh, the, that the village itself are all descendants from one village in upper Germany, old Germany, not what you know as Germany now, but probably would have been closer to, like, Russia, um, migrated to Iceland, and from Iceland to this village in England. Right. And that was all. That was that, and that's where they stayed. And every, and single, and every single person in that village had the direct, same exact the route. Route. Right. The, 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 yeah. Yeah, nobody on the outside moved into this village, probably because it didn't have a name and you couldn't find it. <laughs> But um, but I found it. I drove right into it, and I walked in. Anyway, I walked into this shop. This guy comes out, and he, and I said, uh, "Yes, sir. Hi." And before I could say, "What is this?" He grabbed a set of runes uh, and a box, and on black cloth, and he threw the runes on the black bo- on the black cloth, covered them with a box right away. He drew a rune on his forehead and proceeded to give me a reading, uh, naming the runes and their positions underneath that box. When he was done, he said, child, if I'm wrong, then I'm dead. And he picked up the box and the runes were in the exact position this guy had said. And I went to ask, I said, well, how much do I? And he walked out of the room, closed the door and shut off the lights on me. And I said, um, and he goes, he goes, he goes, you lay, you're dismissed. Well, he gave you your reading. He gave me my reading, but yeah. he, and, and, and I got to tell you, the reading was spot on to what was right. about to happen to you, right? To me. And, um, and things that I would need to delve into my own psychology right. after the, after the 91 Yeah, one. yeah. You don't have to divulge, obviously. Right. Um, but he was, pre- he was spot on. And he walked out and he said, I'm, I was dismissed. And I walked out and the woman said, there's a can behind the door. Um, you can leave him a tip if you'd like, but that's what he does. And, you know, for the most part, uh, you know, I asked if there was a B&B. No. What about the directions? 
What about the oh yeah, I, I got the I got he gave, instructions. He gave you something, right? Yeah, he gave me stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to make sure you don't forget. Uh, yeah, but he gave he gave me he gave me um, uh, what the runes meant. Anyway, when I went back and I was talking to, to to my professor, who we happened to be in Norse mythology at the time, he said um, he looked at and he goes, "I actually don't agree with it to a modern academic source." He goes, "However." A modern academic source doesn't really know what's going on precisely, do they? He goes, I have to tell you, I agree with how it's practiced. He goes, and I agree with how, how he defined everything. And he said, but then, you know, people like us don't get to interview people like him. Right. He goes, they don't, they don't necessarily write book, textbooks. Um, um, <coughs> uh, and it was... It was, it was, uh, I got to tell you, my, my time in Europe, I ran across weird things like this. Yeah, you did. Constantly. Mm -hmm. And I got so much information and, and, and stuff and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you bounce it off a of theory and then you got to practice, bounce it off of practice. And, and those in the chat room and those who know me know that uh, I don't really hold bar. I don't make up for the fantastical stories about my education because I really don't have to. Right. Because what I do have, I don't it, it is beyond really you know the paperwork I, I you know the pedigree I have, is beyond making up little tiny villages. Right. Uh, but I got to tell you these little t it's if you ever go to, to places in Europe or any of the old places, don't go up. Do go off the up beaten path. path. Yeah. Find these little thing places because that's what I did. I, I I'd walk in forests and come across cabins. I would, um, and it was all during times that I needed to clear my mind because of the job I did in the military. And I and I'd actually be searching for something at that moment. And and no joke, it, I came across it. It was manifested. Anyway. That that's 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 my schooling on runes, and, yeah. and and we're going to use this kind of foundation. And I know that most of my foundation, actually, when I did look it up, because I, you know I I was uh, I was looking through the show today, and I looked I went to I went on on the web to bounce off things to, because I didn't you know I want to sound too out there today. Yeah, I didn't. what do you mean with your rune definition? Yeah, I well, well I wanted to see what, where my I, school went to, and I got to tell you, most of the places that are quoting historical, yeah. Um, aren't too far off from what yeah, I learned. Yeah, it's pretty close. Plus, you, you've been teaching this to your students for how long, so you better not be questioning it now. <laughs> <laughs> it's always healthy to question I, yourself. I know, I know it is, and it's nice to, um, I, I mean, it's probably a good idea to check sources every so often. Yeah. Uh, anyway, let's go, let's, let's, uh, you know, enough about my little silly stories. Let's get into the runes. And Vicky, did you know how the, the most popular runes, the, the Futhark, do you know how they were named? I think think yes hang on wait 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 i was gonna say something oh. that totally threw me off oh also um the way i define the runes now i have um used jimmy's definitions when i do do any kind of runic work and i i found that it works for me so i've adopted her uh definitions of the runes because the other the other definitions weren't quite connecting with me so but just because I have doesn't mean you need to, you know. But if you're interested, yeah, have a listen. To, don't you don't have to like said, live it like a Bible, right. but maybe take it to heart, and it might be a way to just kind of an angle to think yeah, of. Yeah. Anyway, or guidance. Who knows? Yeah. Anyway, back to the food. Thing, okay. Do you know? <laughs> well, it's the first letters, right? G says you said do do. Do do. You do you. <laughs> 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 and he got to say you. He got to say it again. Stop! It's so distracting me. <laughs> I've had a trickster energy around me all day today, and I've been thinking that, like, I didn't, I, a I lot of, yeah. So. I have witnesses, and I, and you're proofless. Yeah. <laughs> no, since I got up early this morning, I'm like, what is it today? Revmo. Well, and I'm not going to attribute it to Friday the 13th either. It's, it's Revmo. It's something cheeky. Um, <laughs> anyway, so then you have your um, your first. Well, you, you, the, you, we were to, you were going to talk about the how the Futhark was named because you right. said you did. Yeah, and I'm testing you. I always forget how to pronounce this correctly. I'm such a Theo. 
yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a horrible, uh, when it comes to the languages, I, I slaughter it, like, just like I slaughter Greek. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, fear being an F, er being a U, and there's thorn being a TH, and A's being an A, obviously, rad being an R, and finally Ken being a K, and that spells out Futhark. So and that's the beginning for Yeah, letters. and when you look at them in a downwards manner, I mean, they're going to spell Futhark, you know, visually you can see it a mile away. You know, so yeah, it's not much of a it's not much of a play though. Oh, all right. Be a little more clever. Oh well. <laughs> no. no well, let's let's get to the alphabet. They're yeah. all waiting. Okay, so well, I'm going to rehash all this again. So feel right mm -hmm. is the F. So the Edda is now the Edda. The yeah, Edda is what you want to meditate. This is what yeah. you want to delve into. This is your your meditational aspect. Um, the Edda for the feel is wealth as a comfort to man which must be bestowed, bestowed freely in order to gain honor. And the meaning is wealth, money, mobile property, financial prosperity. But it is more than that. Fear also represents cattle. So it is wealth and money and prosperity, but that which must be nurtured and cared for. Um, it also has that interesting bit of bestowed freely, in order to gain honor it reflects to the ownership of that property with no strings debt cannot be a comfort so it was also referring to the need to own what you have to have that comfort you know you know i want to point out something real right. quick because i do do the languages yes you do i do i do um i slaughter english <laughs> But I, I can do the language. We can and just blame that on Latin. We'll just blame that on that. But right. you know, one of the one of the things that I noticed uh, when studying the languages, uh, with their divination meaning, is that the first letter of all the ancient languages, all meant wealth, and they all meant cattle, mm. and it all meant to be bestowed freely, and it all meant wealth as uh, to be nurtured. Now the rest of the letters kind of go out of order, and they're all over the place, and they kind of you know eventually meet up here and there. But the first letter of every one of the alphabets had that meaning. Yeah. You know, when I first came here, I noticed that a lot of, like, because, you know, Mexico is right there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these trucks would drive by and they'd have cattle on them. And I said, Jimmy, what's up with the cattle? And I said, and, it's wealth. And it's wealth. So, well, even in Mexico, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, yep. it's right there. Yeah. Just as an aside, you know, I just found that interesting. Yeah. Yep, yep. Let's move on to the next letter, er. Yeah. Which is you. You do er. I do er. Um, um, the, you know the other interesting thing about it being er? Mm. It's supposed to supposedly where the actual Garden of Pet uh, That's of, what of I was going to say. Yeah. In uh, Sumeria. Right. Anyway, er, which is you. Actually, uh, the Edda is the great savage Uruks who fight with their horns and tremble the earth beneath them. You got to know what an Uruk is, first of all. It's a big, huge, I mean, it was bigger than any of the, of the, um, uh, What kind of beast is, how would you describe cattle. them? Cattle. It like would be like a cow, like a steer. A huge steer. I guess, and, yeah. Yeah, it was right. wild cattle, and it used to roam along Europe, and they were huge. Now, the meaning is strength and physical strength and vitality, but let's look deeper into that, Edda. These were untamed, huge wild cattle. Personal, raw, and tameable power, and the li and so if you take a look at it, it's kind of like the like like the universe, isn't it? Right. The limitless power of the universe that can be tapped into, and if you know that for a fact, then uh, you know that you can bring about unlimited personal energy and creative potential with it. Right. Okay. So the next one is thorn, which is the th, and the edda for this is the exceedingly sharp thorn. That is evil to the touch of a warrior, but a blessing to the touch of a farmer. Interesting. Me yeah, yeah. Meaning, violence, conflicts and complexities of an aggressive nature. It also denotes the resistant and protective qualities of the tree. It is the symbol of masculine force. It goes even further and deeper. It tells you to learn and look beyond the first thoughts and definitions. Everything has a polarity. Everything can be used to create both a barrier and a weapon. It denotes the need for an active defense and how to use it without becoming aggressive yourself. Um, it, it, it's also Thor. Well, yeah. Yeah. Thor's hammer. Exactly. Thor's hammer created inside the workshop. 
I know. I swing my hands around like I'm actually teaching a class <laughs> as I just sit here with you. Um, uh, and then I whack the mic. <laughs> it's just another sound effect. Yeah, I know. Um, the, you know, the next one is um, uh, A's. As. As, yeah. Uh, it's the letter A. And the Edda is the mouth as the source of all language and wisdom is immortal. Now, it's inspiration, it's the multiverse in, in magical and religious acts, it's gaining knowledge, and it refers to communications, vibrations, and melody. Now, the first thing that everybody has to remember is that, especially in these philosophies, not a lot was written. Right. Not a lot that we can find on it. A lot of it was word of was mouth. Word of mouth. I mean, a lot of Most ancient Most knowledge and history yeah. was recorded in the form of Eddas and songs that were then relayed by bards. Yeah. And, uh, and therefore, the mouth was considered the only source of wisdom mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. And because words create vibrationally and everything was repeated over and over and over and over again, it was immortal. You know, in the old days, uh, referring back to when I, when I, when I learned, right. you know, back before they had like paper and ink. <laughs> um, seriously, though, uh, my, my teachers didn't actually allow for notes or books. What? Everything was oral and everything had to be memorized. That must have been nuns. No. No, I'm talking about... <laughs> I, I took it at your uni. I, not, not the university, because those were allowed. Yeah. The things, the people that I hit that oh, were classically oh, trained. Oh, oh, yeah. All the tiny yeah. uh, villages. Yeah. They, yeah. If you took out a piece of paper to write something, they pieces, stopped talking to you. Pieces of paper can be lost, can be burnt, can be right. destroyed. It's Everything lives in... They called it a crutch. Right, yeah. Exactly. They said that so. by taking notes, I was using a crutch. And you weren't absorbing or gaining a true understanding Standing of, of what you're being taught. And he said yeah. that, he goes, because it was on a piece of paper, I would more than likely follow it like a Bible. Right. But if it was vibrationally inside so my head, head right. it would become a part of me. And therefore, I would absorb it and live it right. rather than just memorize it and learn it right. and and it really was about it was really about becoming part of you yeah. and and it was interesting because yes my history yeah. was written uh, in notes and stuff like that in school and 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 history should be written but but the deeper understanding of the actual practical yeah. side it became immortal when i heard it through the yeah. mouth and but the thing is what um these people got to hear it like more than on one occasion. I mean, I and I totally agree and understand with what you're saying. But what if you were only to hear it once and there was a lot of information? I mean, do you take I with you? I got a lot of information. You've got a. F I mean, hang on, your photographic memory doesn't serve you in this case. But I mean, do you take with what you will? You know, at that point, and what is lost is lost. I think when you realize that you have to use the uh, the vibrations, you just you memorize more. you retain more because you have to absorb it more. Right. Say. Let's say we didn't podcast. Right. Let's say we didn't archive. Let's say that the, that that if you wanted to hear it, all they had was what was in this room, and there was no way for them to replay it to hear it again. I I guarantee the people in the room would remember more. Yeah, you know, when on reflection, the 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 stuff that stayed with me over the years and the made a huge is the stuff I heard and witnessed. Yeah. Stuff that I there's there's no way I would receive via the written format anyway because it wasn't published. So yeah, you know you you're right. When I did I have put it to the test to a degree, and yeah, it does actually stay with you for like forever. It does, you know. It does, and therefore it becomes immortal. I'm just worried about if there's a volume of information. Uh, in I my mean, case, the get photographic memory does serve because I do remember. You, you put it in pictures because I'd either put it in pictures in my mind. Or I, uh, what I can do is total recall the person back in front of me talking again. Right, right, like a like a movie. Yeah, I can replay the movie of, of them well, talking. Well, not, not many people have that. Gift, I know, you know. And so. I think the fact that I do, they only repeated it once to me. Right, right. Yeah, because I'm saying traditionally in villages, and so they'll hear it over, over and over and over and over. How many times in their lifetime? Right, but it, it's it, it, everything was oral, and it wasn't necessarily to it be. Um, um, yeah, don't. 
<laughs> Fabiola, you're going to be in my class for the next 10 years anyway. She comes to your class every day. I mean, every opportunity, whether she takes She's notes or not. She's going to move in with us next. I know. We're going to nail it to the floor. But it, it, it really was, and this and this had a actually this had a right. actually means a lot to me. Yeah. Because it really was uh, about taking it in and it becoming part of you, and it's uh, the vibrations that you hear and things that come out of people's mouths. Right. And, and take from that what you will. I took it as. Um, I, if I take notes now, you've seen my notes. Right. They're like a little dash with like one word that I need to know. And you look at it and go, I don't, what? Mm hmm. That's you, why you I don't, don't let take you take the, notes. That's why you don't let me take notes. Because <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it's in your head, but not mine. <laughs> go ahead, though. I'm off, I'm off that All subject. All right. Um, R. Um, and the editor is The Warrior's Journey, which is easy to complete. Contemplate. Contemplate, sorry. Contemplate, but difficult to traverse, meaning journey. Uh, travel both in physical terms and those of lifestyle direction. This is a time when you must employ a vehicle to achieve your goals. It will be a time that you need to have perseverance in your life. It is a time for necessary change in your energies to get what is right and just for you. But it, and it's really you got, you got to stand stand strong there. Yeah, you really do. Ken, Ken, the edit is the pale, bright flame of the church, of the church. I know. <laughs> I just washed my tongue and I didn't set it right and I didn't have time to blow dry it. Mm -hmm. uh, the pale, bright flame of the torch, which illuminates the kin's castle, illuminates the mind. Meaning, guidance, creativity, and the strengthening of abilities in all realms. But it's really more than that, if you think about it, because it actually refers to your ancestry. What gifts and guidance do we have, not just from the immediate circle of our family lines, but also your lineage? Right. Because, you know, if people people don't think that they have these gifts. And, mm -hmm. you know, you know who's a big believer in that? Native Americans. Right. They know that just because they're Native American, that they have connections, and they do. And That's I got because they place a huge emphasis on their ancestors. ancestors we don't. Yeah, and we don't. And and, and in Norse and Celtic religions, yeah. ancestors were important because it was thought that the lineage just isn't DNA. Uh, that it was yeah. also wisdom and and gifts of the family, yeah. and and the and the bloodlines in the village yeah. that was ingrained into the family line. Yeah, just because they're physically not here does not mean the connection is severed. Yeah. And now the greatest no. thing now is. <laughs> Uh, so many people are not, um, um, <laughs> uh, it, so many people can't, can't say, um, uh, Aurora, if you can't stay, um, you can make sure you catch it on Podomatic because we do, we do place the podcasts right. up. Right. Um, and thank you for, for attending tonight and, and your kind words there. Um, but however, uh, it, it, your bloodlines, uh, we're lucky nowadays right. because it used to be that you just had one bloodline. Now so many people have many. Yeah. And there's many gifts that you can you can actually lock into. And people don't take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. They really don't. I'll shut up. Your turn. <laughs> Q4 with his uh, G. Um, the editor is the gift bestowed on the needy, giving credit, honor, and dignity, meaning generosity, all matters relating to exchanges, including contracts and sacrifice. It is about generosity as well as exchanges but it goes deeper it has the idea that the gift that you give or that you receive should be one something that is needed um, two gives credit honor and dignity there are huge stipulations to this it's a time to look at what you give to people and what they give to you all of which should follow these two stipulations or not given or not received. No, seriously. You know how many people give you a gift and their strings attached? Oh, all the time. All the That's time. That's why I'm always like, no, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. And, and and that's a big thing. Yeah. We're going to take a slight music. We're going to listen to another song so right. that we can um, get something to drink. And um, I have to run get to the, the little wee bird um, room. And, and, and you have go. to get the frog out of my throat. And mm -hmm. you've got to get the frog out of your throat. So enjoy Snow W.Y. Uh, Europa. Mm -hmm.
All right, we're back. You know, welcome back to Occultist Radio, and, and and I don't think I say I don't think I really remember to put this in, and that is, uh, we're Occultist Radio, and for those on the podcast, we're on Paraquest Radio Network. This show and all the wonderful programs on this station comes to you thanks to the vision of two two people. Those of you in the t- in the chat room, you're in the chat room with them right now, okay. That is, uh, he goes by G-Money in the chat room. His name is Greg. And sometimes G-Monkey. Sometimes G-Monkey. <laughs> but uh, the mighty, mighty Greg and the wonderful Serenity and their creation of PQRN. Right. Also from the dedication of some of the best and most passionate hosts in the field of the cult and paranormal. And that really is, um, that's really something because, you know... Uh, we wouldn't. We wouldn't. I don't know if we would have would have had the venue because it was so much work and there's so much time we to looked, do this. We looked for four years um, <clears throat> for a venue for an avenue to actually um, bring to life a cultist radio. You know, this was like four, we sat on it for like four or five years, waiting for an opportunity to, to present itself. Otherwise, we would have had to have been on twenty four seven, run our store, live our lives, and it, it was impossible. So, so really, uh, we're you know, really, this, we're pretty grateful. Yeah, we are, and 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 all of you, um, you know, if you're in the chat room, you know, give a big, huge thank you to Greg and Serenity, mm-hmm. because you know, without them, you, we wouldn't have the venue to actually give you all of the uh, info, and and the education and feature and, this great music and amazing guests. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So anyway, um, did I kiss the boss's ass enough? No, I'm just kidding. I thought you wanted the bosses now. <laughs> we are. <laughs> we are. No, it's, it really is something. This is, a, you know, PQRN mm-hmm. is really a great station with a lot of freedom. And uh, and they really gave us some freedom to uh, maneuver around. Uh, we're using our show. Uh, pretty much told us we could do anything and everything we wanted. So we have. And with that said, let's go, uh, let's go back to uh, the ruins. And that is uh, Win W, Etta, Joy, which knows not uh, suffering, sorrow, or anxiety. And the meaning is satisfaction, happiness, general success, and recognition of worth. But that's a, that's a really a powerful Etta right. there. It's a, it's a wonderful statement at the same time. And I'm not sure how I can actually expand on it. Uh, uh, you know, it's pure joy. And when you have this kind of pure joy... Uh, it only really comes uh, when one is recognized for their true worth, and we don't do it enough, nor do we re- we receive it enough. You know, we, we, we don't give people that kind of, of adoration and recognition when they sh- really should have it, and they, should, they really should be told what, what their worth is. And um, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Oh, I like that. She put Pam Pipples. I know. <laughs> um, uh, and, 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 you know, an interesting side note, that those listening to Occultist Radio, is that Greg and Serenity uh, brought us on board as part owners, and uh, just unbelievable, huh? Right. Anyway, uh, back to your rib. Okay, Hegel, which is the letter H. Um, Edda is hail as the widest grain, which is walled from the heavens, tossed by the winds, and melted into water meaning disruption, disruption by natural events and uncontrolled forces. But it is more than that, much more. It is a disruption by something uncontrolled, even a slight destruction. After all, hail can destroy a crop, but afterwards it actually helps make the crops grow taller and stronger and output more. This is a bump in your road. Don't let it knock you down. Let it be a learning experience, one that makes you stronger. One that makes you wiser, and one that makes you grow. That you know, I I got I really do love the others. Uh, they're, they're so stunning. They really are. Uh, need need, and tr- the Edda is trouble, which at once oppresses the heart, yet serves in its constraint as a source of salvation for those who perceive its true value. And the meaning of it is really uh, trouble uh, needs. As opposed to wants, most most be uh, must be overcome by hard work. And again, another deeper meaning in this: in the midst of our troubles, we should stop and try to find the value and salvation that it is teaching us. Otherwise, it becomes a meaningless exercise in a futility, and really, life shouldn't be that. 
it really shouldn't. And there's a saying, there's a saying uh, it really shouldn't. And you know what? Most people think that their life is, 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 is filled with all of these troubles and... Um, Sorry. Sorry. No, we're still... Um, no. Somebody in the chat room said they lost sound. No. No, we're still up. Okay, okay. we're still up. All right. Okay. Um, uh, anyway, a lot of people think that their life is um, is filled with with uh, all these futile exercises of of worthlessness, and they don't understand why they have all these troubles. And really, if you just looked at it, you might find salvation. You know what I mean? There may be a salvation in it, and there's actually a saying that goes along with this round. That, um, that is, use thy destiny. Mm -hmm. Do not strive against it. Right. And I cannot tell you how great that statement right there is. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next one's ice. Um, ice, ice, baby. Uh, I knew you were <laughs> going to do that. Ice, which is the letter I. Very cold and slippery ice. Clear as glass and gem-like, meaning blockage. A standstill that may be good or bad. Let's go further into what this means. Ice, ice is interesting, very stagnant, cold, unforgiving, but really it's just a frozen moment in time. It will melt, it will nourish if used correctly. It's only a moment in time, one that you can use to catch up and catch your breath. Because ice is only that right. moment, it's just it, a it's, moment frozen yeah. in time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, boy, when they hit that moment, they, they panic, they freak. And you know when you say it will nourish if used correctly, can you take it as a moment, some clarity, like nourish the yeah. mind, yes, yeah. not just the body? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, G says we're Vegemite pet, pet pushers, by the way. <laughs> Our next rune is Jera, and that is a J. Etta, the harvest when the gods suffer the earth to produce fruit and vegetables for rich and poor alike, meaning as the harvest hopes and expectations, the results of earlier efforts are realized. Um, I gotta tell you, this goes further because it really is, it really is about a distinction that there's no distinction between classes. Right. And it makes no difference in education either. Because it really is about a time to um, to reap what you have sowed. And and it's what you've put out there. And rich or poor alike, you can you can you can reap these harvests. And a lot because you know you know how you get a lot of people a lot, a lot of people that say, um, they'll say things like, well, how do I know I can? Right. Well, because the gods will suffer the earth, rich or poor alike. Right, right, right. And they weren't talking necessarily about money, yeah. but it could have been about education. Exactly. And, and, but it was the time that everybody put in. Yeah. Okay. Um, E-O, L? I mean, E-L. You know. No. No. E-I. E-I, sorry. E-I-E-I-O. E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> <laughs> My eyes are so blurry. Oh, no, I know it's E-I. God damn it. <laughs> um, uh, I'm telling you. Oh, I know. I'm losing it today. Okay. Okay, I'm telling you, there's tricksters. They're abounding. An angel just lost its wing because you cussed. I know. Very softly. Okay. <laughs> the Edda for the eel is the yew tree. With its tough bark and strong roots, it is a gu guardian of fire, meaning enduring, resilient, strength to deflect difficulty or problems, to have strong roots, to hold tight to what you know and believe in the face of problems, um, probably in opposition, um, to not be swayed and you endure. Uh, that, that's a good one, isn't it? Right. Um. Let's do a real short song. Okay, just really short. Just a really short one. This is Rebel Jacobs. It's like a minute and a half just for us to catch up.
Welcome back to Goldish Radio on the infamous and world famous PQRN. Our next rune is the P Orth. P. And the Edda is the chessman on a chessboard as a source of recreation and amusement is an initiation for warriors. And the meaning is concealed, something unknown or not yet revealed. A mystery in the same sense that an unborn child is a mystery. But it's also the idea that one can begin to bring forth the concealed patterns in your life. This is important if you wish to break unhealthy cycles. It is also the idea that one has complete control over one's own destiny and fate. You're no longer a simple pawn. You can move through your life with calculated movements. That's huge. Mm -hmm. That's huge because all of a sudden all these victims of fate and destiny. Right. You're wrong. Mm -hmm. You're wrong. And that's, that's not just according to the runes either. A lot of the philosophies believe mm -hmm. there is no such thing. Yep. Um, okay. Elhaz, which is the Z. Elks, Elksedge. I always throw it. That throws me every time. Elksedge grows mainly in the Finlands, flourishing in the water. It grimly wounds, running with blood of anyone trying to grasp it. Like it's razor sharp, guys. Okay, the meaning is protection. Shelter oneself. Luck through striving, a successful outcome to a quest. It also protects. It is used in battles. It is also the need to move forward with caution. So you, I know, I know, I know it's razor sharp because Jimmy has told me some tales with. <laughs> so she's had a couple of run-ins with his plant. <laughs> Uh, it, it's an aquatic plant, obviously. Yeah, and uh, and and you know, uh, again, back. Back in that little village that I wandered into, um, I always came with a um, boot knife because I was military and we always walked around with something. And um, the thing is, is that um, uh, they told me about this elk sedge. And they told me that, that, that I, I, to watch it, both as a warrior I, and things like that. And they told me to actually go look at it. Well, looking is not my... My and big forte. I got to no, I got to poke and touch. It's not your forte. It is, and I just you know I look with my hands, yeah. and um, I, I put my uh, my boot knife into the water, and it wrapped around my boot knife, and you can't lose your boot knife because then you have to buy another one and you get a rip in your record for it, and um, I, I you know I put my hand in there to untangle my boot knife, and it sliced the palm of my hand, and it just it, it, blood went blood went everywhere. And I, I, I ended up leaving the boot knife to the didn't gods. They, didn't they tell you to not feed? The yeah, they said, don't feed, don't feed, don't feed the elk sedge. Yeah. They said, don't feed the runes. And I said, and, and I said, but it's my boot knife and I have to have it back. And then he, they said, just leave it to the, they want the boot knife, let them have the boot knife. And really what it was is that, uh, what they, how they would use it is that they would lay it down softly. They'd have it all kind of plowed downwards, mm -hmm. this, this, this razor sharp, um, stupid aquatic plant and it's long and then stupid. on the top it's got like three little, little things prongs. prongs that come out it's like mm. a hand and um uh it's uh it's it's uh, what they would do is they'd put it down then they'd send a couple of people over and the enemies would be approaching and they'd run back through it and they were naked because they didn't want their clothes to rustle it and you know they'd run them back and they'd drag their swords behind them and there, and bring the elk sedge up. Well, the enemies would go running through that, and it would wrap around their legs, and start to cut their legs, and they would become ensnared. And, and they would become ensnared, yeah. and then they would take their swords and they take it into the water to cut to cut their legs free, and their swords would become ensnared, and then they'd reach their hands down there, and then their hands would get cut up. And while they were fighting with this plant, um, the Celts and the Highlanders were able to come down and just um, um, knock the, knock the, you know, just stab them, <laughs> kill them. And the elk sedge was it was two things, and um, so it's to move forward with caution and and things like that. And um, this elk sedge plant is is really something and and i learned my lesson with it really clearly but i didn't learn it enough because the guy who threw the runes one of the things i will say uh I tell about is that he said to watch the elk sedge because he because watch the elk sedge 
He goes, because if you feed it, there'll be a war. You'll go into war, and when you go into war, the elk sedge will cut you. And I just thought that, you know, it was a war for my boot knife. And it turns out that I go. And uh, Vicki will attest to this. All the damage on, on me is to my legs. My legs and the left hand. The hand that I grabbed the elk sedge with. Mm -hmm. And that is where the, the bulk of the damage came to me from my military experience. From being a warrior. And I think that is... I think that says a lot. Anyway, the uh, sigil. Come on. Okay. The sigil is the oh. S. Is is S? It's the sun red. Um, the sun. Uh, the Edda is the sun guides back to land from their journey over the ocean and over the land, and the meaning is victory, success, or other favorable circumstances. And it really can't be just be described beyond that. It really isn't. It really is simply just uh, ultimate in success through the use of your own will, and it was an individual's will creating change in a bigger fashion. Right. Okay, so um, am I doing the next one? Okay, you're done. Okay, Tear, which is a T, the Edda is the pole star as a guiding star that never fails to keep its course over the midst of the night, meaning justice, success in, com 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 yeah. success in competition in legal matters, honor, leadership, and authority. There is a deeper meaning to this, and it is about the sacrifice of staying the course to achieve the positive outcome. By doing so, you will build a powerful spiritual will. Mm -hmm. mm. And that's important to have. Right. Absolutely. Bar, which is the bee. Edda, birch tree, which bears no fruit, yet is generated seed. Which yet... Oh, let me start the Edda again. I know, we're both tongue-tied today. I just put gel on my tongue, too, and it's still not setting right. Uh, birch tree, which bears no fruit, yet is generated seed from its leaves, whose branches form a heavenly crown. And the meaning is renewal, healing, recovery, physical or spiritual regeneration, a new growth from old roots, and motherhood. And you know what? But, but, you know, doing this, you have to do it with the realm of the self to reach deep inside the self-regeneration. What it's telling you mm. is you really can't regenerate yourself and you can't really regenerate yourself on the outside. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, Hunter wants to know why you just can't cut the plant. Um, because the plant it's is a, razor it's, shaped it's, as it is and as fibrous as it is. It's a strong it's fibrous material. But it's still a plant and it's aquatic, which yeah. means that it would bend with the bolt cutters. Yeah, it would just be sl slimy, slimy and very pliable, so yeah. there'd be nothing to hold on to. Yeah. They're trying to tell me ways to get my boot knife back. It's gone, honey. I'm, I'm, I'm good with it. It's like a long time <laughs> ago. <laughs> way, way back before there was TV. <laughs> Yeah, we're talking like 50 years ago here. Okay. Hey, um, I'm not that old. Bar, which is a B. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Where are you at? I already finished that. <laughs> I'm so not focused. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm serious. I'm sitting. You know what it is? It's, You're cereal. I'm cereal. It's it's this board. <laughs> it's throwing me. Uh, okay, eh. <laughs> Are you Canadian, eh? <laughs> Which is M. Uh, I just feel delirious now. I'm so tired. Okay, um, glorious horses whose pride is in its hoofs and a joy to man, meaning loyalty. Status as it relates between you and others. It is being able to show pride in the work that you do, a projection of your magical powers by what you can show for yourself. We're going to move right to man. Which is M? That's the the edit is man. We're not talking about man like 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 um like um masculine. It's just man as human race. Right. Man who is dear to his kin but doomed to the grave by the gods. And the meaning is intellect, power of human intelligence, rationality, memory, and tradition. And this represents the full range of human experience, and the need to embrace it so that your total potential can be realized. Now that's something because if you don't if you don't have a full range of human experiences, right, you actually can't have your potential realized. Uh uh. I'm I'm going to throw out just another thing because right. we are podcasting worldwide, right? And I want people to to really get where we're you know you know where you're at. You're at the Occultist Radio on the PQR and network. Oh my God! Worldwide and famous. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but you know what people um ask. 
ask and yeah. and I guess we're not saying PQRN enough in our podcast I don't think so that when they're down I don't think we're saying it at all, all. Um, yeah. and so when they download the podcast they're not quite sure where we're streaming and we are streaming on the on, on the worldwide uh, known uh, PQRN yep okay so. alright so on with the show um, Lagu which is an L the unending depths of the ocean whose waves terrify all who ride them and cannot be bridled, meaning passage, initiation into life, as when a heathen child is sprinkled with water and given a name, the primal waters of Nephimah. It refers to more than just that. It took, talk, <sighs> talks about terrifying experiences. Life is like that. It is a passage but not without its dangers and risks, just as magic is. But you cannot live without making that passage. You can't um, attain enlightenment without it. It's almost like the abyss. It, you know what? It's it's exactly like going over Da'oth. Yeah, it's the Da'oth. It really is. This, this really does talk about the Da'oth. Uh, the next one is um, Ing, and that is... No, it's NG. Yeah. <laughs> and the here and the other is hero in who moved ever eastward. And the meaning is gestation, potential energy that must ever grow go a period of time uh, in order to uh, gain strength. Now, I, I gotta tell you something about Ing. Ing was actually a, a really big military leader. And right. at the time a lot of the military what they would do, uh, he actually was quite um, revolutionary in his mm -hmm. time. And, and this is really something to think about and, and, and uh, consider how it applies to you. And that is uh, where most of the countries and most of the fighting uh, fa factions of Europe during that time, they would march, 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 get to a place and fight. You'd lose at least 10% of your men on the way there. Uh, by the time they got there, at least another 30 to 40% was so exhausted that they were no good to you on the field. And the rest of them were pretty tired too and they didn't fight but Ing mm -hmm. Ing actually did something different he actually would move forward in spurts right he would go he'd do this big push forward and mm -hmm. then rest right and then do another big push forward and then rest Isn't so that, that he did military maneuver? maneuver now right now, have almost every military From now way, yeah now 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 has adopted it from right. way back when yeah. but he was the first one that did and he pushed ever eastward mm -hmm. moving constantly Mm -hmm. But he would do it in spurts, and then he would rest, and he'd make sure that they could regain their 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 strength before going if, again. Yeah. Now, isn't that what we tell people in their spell working? Yeah, absolutely. All every day. Do it like a wave. Yep. Okay. Now, for those people, if somebody's ever called you a dag, you need not despair. For check out the following. Hey, you <laughs> no, call me a dag all the time. I'm actually throwing some kind words your way because as you know dag is a d and it's god's glorious light of day which gives hope to all and that is you I give and i'm hope not to being and i'm not being facetious i give hope that to actually the is that you be fed. you're a great teacher meaning an awakening <laughs> daylight clarity a time to embark on a new enterprise it is the end of one cycle and the beginning of another. It is a time of celebration and focus. It is. Yeah. It is. It is. And, and that's the whole thing. And, and as you, uh, you know, because a lot of people don't like changes. Right. Changes are not people's things. Right. You don't like changes. I don't. Mm -hmm. But I've been embracing them lately. I know. Mm-hmm. But in this case, it's like a whole life change. Right. And, and, Absolutely. And so what they're saying is that the gods give a, the glorious light of day, gives hope to all. Mm -hmm. Meaning everybody should embrace these the, the new cycles of their lives with mm -hmm. hope. Mm -hmm. Instead of going, oh, God, something new. Mm -hmm. uh, Odal, this is our last one. Last our one. last room uh, is an O. And the Edda is the home, which is a source of all prosperity and happiness for men. Meaning, folkland, inheritance, inheritances, your home, physical and spiritual heritage. It is another rune that tells you really, to really go back to the family line and heritage, that your strengths will be there. Wow, how fun was that? Right. Are we how gonna, fun was that for everyone? I hope everyone had fun with that. They're probably going, yay. Yay, it's over. So are we going to, I mean, I know we're past time as per usual. As per usual. Um, do you want to quickly cover some rune castings? Yes. Yeah. Just a couple of things. Just to... I mean, we, it just has to be a quickie. Go for it. Which? Well, you're wasting you know. time. 
Go. Oh my god. Procrastinating. Go ahead, you do it. Go ahead. No. One room, one room quickie. Oh my god. <laughs> Seriously, what's going into you tonight? <laughs> this is I don't know. Loki? Yeah, um, totally. Uh, one rune quickie. That is to be used to, you, you take a rune, you grab it out of a bed, you take all your big runes, you know, shake them up. Yeah. You know, shake that bag up. Well, yeah. I mean, okay. do a little dance with it. It's too many for your hands. It really is. Yeah. But then you grab it, you reach in, you grab a rune, yeah. a random rune, and uh, that is specific to your need at the time, right. and it's what you need to focus on in the here and now. You can actually draw uh, three it's runes out of the bag. That's right. called a three rune quickie. Right. And the first one that you draw. Well, it's not really called a three rune quickie, but. Actually, it is. It is for you? No, it's actually referred to that in many books. Oh, okay. I just. All right. They're just called quickies because they're not a full a full spread. Yeah, yeah. I just think, see it as an overview. Yeah. Right. Well, but they're, they're, they're doing it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you know what I mean? All right. So, um, you, it's uh, you, you, the first rune you draw out is the negative uh, influence that's going on right now. It could be in your mind. It could be around you. Then the second one is the positive, And the third one is the outcome that you should be focusing on or at least paying attention to. All right. Want to cover the full cast? Yeah. It is the idea of taking the runes and ow, and holding them up about six to eight inches above your cloth and just let the runes fall. Um, you know, try not to bounce them off the table. Um, and read the ones that land face up because they're the most important ones. And the ones closer to the middle, you know, of, I mean, you're going to visually, I just say the table or like yeah. whatever your visual was that, that denoted the center. Um, those ones closer to the center uh, as that which is the most um, present in, in that given time. So, and the ones that land face down are in the future. And, so, of course, it works itself out from, right, the, from yeah, the middle. Yeah, it goes, it goes in an outwards fashion. Uh, and those that touch each other actually relate to each, each other. other. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you, for those kind of readings, I do suggest you draw it out, shade in the ones that were landed face down so yeah. that you can actually sit down and really work and it. And get, don't be afraid to take a couple of weeks to work it. Yeah, deconstructed and yeah, reconstructed. De and now, I want to quickly talk, uh, touch on finding runes because a yeah. lot of people don't know what those are and yeah. it's a really quick and explanation. It's, it, and it's a, word, it's a term that's um, banded about quite a bit. So Yeah, and a lot of people think that the, ba the binding runes are used to actually bind somebody. Yeah, They're really not. It's a misnomer. What it is is if you wanted two runes and you wanted them to work together, then you would actually construct a brand new sigil mm -hmm. of the two runes, right. having them connect to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times if there's a straight line in it somewhere, then you just connect yeah. the, uh, the outer bits. Yeah, it's like when we do, um, you know, what it, I don't know if there's a terminology for it. When you write out your intention, then you cross out the letters that are... We'll cover that in a sigil class. Yeah, and then you create, but it's kind of like a sigil class listen to me we're going to cover that in a sigil show in a sigil show <laughs> slash class yeah i guess i guess it's confusing to talk about it yeah right um uh, we'll do it when we have phil hines on Ooh, ooh, <gasps> letting the cat out of the bag i am uh next week guys we um we're going to be live yeah however the show the the guest isn't yeah it was a pre-recorded show although done live on the network yeah uh, and there some were some people caught it some I think, people yeah. caught it uh but we have the um um the wonderful Le uh Le Lila Wendell and uh she is probably uh in my opinion and in a lot of people's opinion one of the only experts on the entity of death and necromancy uh, since the Middle Ages. I don't think there's been anybody really. Um, so we're going to have Lila Wendell in um, next week. And we hope you enjoyed this show. We're working on some great shows uh, coming up. But we have Lila Wendell coming up next week. And afterwards, we're actually going to talk about necromantic practices, mm -hmm. necromancy, uh, and uh, things like that. And she's a really wonderful, a wonderful person, and she has a lot to say. And uh, thank you for listening to Occultist Radio on the Paraquest Radio Network, PQRN. We're going to leave you guys with um, Space Waves walking by. And we'll see you all next week. Okay. Say goodnight, Gracie. <sighs>
<laughs> You're not going to play into that, are you? No, no. Anyway. Um, okay, we'll, we'll check you out next week. Um, thanks for listening, and we'll leave you with some... What is it? Space waves. Space waves walking by. Walking by.